Hi, everyone. Um, I'm here with Andrea. I'm Angela. And we're going to talk a little bit about self-directed education today. And I think um, maybe to start, we just give a little background about who we are, because this, the information that we'll talk about today is has like a certain vibe to it. So Andrea comes from a spiritual background and is also a mindfulness practitioner. And I also am a conscious parenting guide. And I also um, work at a self-directed education school, like a Sudbury school. But my, my training has really been 15 years in the, in the spiritual community, um, which is like, I'm really interested in stuff that is like illusion transcending spirituality, which basically looks at um, our limiting beliefs and uh, the law of attraction and, and stuff like that. So um, it's, it's very interesting because coming from those backgrounds, a lot of people are driven towards self dredging directed education it seems to really make sense there um oh and madeline's joining too yay um we're just figuring out how to go live we're we're gonna take this one step at a time it's the first time we've done this so we're just figuring out the technicalities of how to actually get live on facebook um but yeah what about you andrea do you want to give a little background about uh where you come from yeah maybe we'll just say i'd rather just talk for the hour and okay. we can we can work on the technical part, but why don't we just let everyone know that this will be in the group. So if you're fine being on camera, keep it on, but you can always go off camera if you prefer. Um, and we'll, we can, we'll just post this talk and then hopefully next week we can um, get it to actually go live. Um, yeah, so you're right. Yep, um, I'm a meditation teacher, which is, you know, one of the biggest tools to being um, to mindfulness. And um, I consider myself spiritually awake. Um, so I had a spiritual, I, I was always really spiritual, but I had a big awakening um, in 2010. And um, I just, I had been doing a lot of studying and meditation and my view on the world changed just kind of overnight when I had that awakening. And um, I, I went from feeling kind of like a victim to life, like life was happening to me. And what I realized with with studying the law of attraction was that um, I was, life was actually responding to me. Um, and it was really empowering because I went from feeling like um, a victim to feeling like empowered. And um, a lot of things happened in my life. A, a, lot, a lot of things really dramatically changed, um, but I didn't end up getting pregnant and think about thinking about becoming a parent until 2013. Um, and at that time I was really into Abraham Hicks, which I still love Abraham Hicks. Um, so the, while I was pregnant, I went through like another set of healing and a lot of trauma came up from my childhood. And, um, I, I really was, was, um, just determined to find a better way to school my child than in the process of her being controlled for, for six plus hours a day. And, um, you know, all of that control that's built into the traditional education system left me feeling insecure and irrelevant. And I just came up with this like work hard that I needed to constantly prove myself um, that, that I didn't have inherent worth, that my worth only came from my actions. Um, so when I became pregnant, I was like, I need to find a better way. Um, I wanted my child to be in a system that she could feel whole as is. She didn't need to be tested and graded and judged all the time. Um, and so thankfully, I listened to Abraham Hicks on parenting, and they talked about the Sudbury School. Um, and then I, you know, found out about self-directed education, child-led education, Montessori method. Um, and so just so everyone understands my background, um, I was raised in traditional education. I'm almost 50, so that was over 30 years ago. Um, but my daughter has not been. She's eight now. She has never been in traditional education. We did private school, and now we're doing homeschool unschooling. So I'm executing the self-directed education at home with her. Um, so that's just the perspective I come from. Yay, thank you. Yeah. Um, 
and then also me as well. So I'm a mom. I have four, I have four kids and they were in Montessori school when they were younger. It was more like a daycare situation when they were, they were that, that young, but same, my kids have never been to Reagan school. They've, they've always been unschooled. And, um, to me, it just really spoke to me. I found it naturally. I was just doing research online and it seemed to align with, uh, the spiritual values that I had become accustomed to. Um, I'm a big follower of like being able to follow your passions and that your passions actually mean something. They're not, they're not there for no reason. And that we can actually trust the unfolding of life. So as you follow what speaks to your heart, you're naturally brought towards the learning that's uh, needed, you know, the learning that's needed for your particular life path and whatever else is, is like additional that they don't come across you don't really need you know why do we why do we need to to me that kind of uh felt like living from fear like we need to put a bunch of added information um into our kid for fear that they're going to miss out on something and there was a core belief there in my opinion that was just not trusting how life unfolds so unschooling seemed like such a perfect fit and as as we went through the process so my oldest son is 10 we've been unschooling um for probably about um like four or five years now i don't even know it's been a while but as we went through the process i realized that a lot of the healing was actually for me in undoing a lot of uh, the learning that i had picked up from regular school um so yeah, it's definitely been a process. And I'm just curious. So I noticed we have, um, we have a, a few people on the call. Does anyone have any specific questions perhaps about, about unschooling um, or about how it works or anything coming up for you that you'd like to ask? Um, you can go ahead and either raise your hand or talk in chat if you have anything specific that you'd like to talk about. Um, oh, Raquel says that her connection isn't holding. So she might be coming in and out, um, but uh, yeah. There's anything just, that you want to talk about, Andrea? I just wanted to to um, say that Angela and I both use self directed education and unschooling interchangeably, and really the the base the what I believe is the definition is the child leads their education with what they're interested in, what they're passionate about, what they're, what they're naturally driven to, um, and how that's different from traditional schooling. Yeah, traditional schooling is, is the um, curriculum is preset by the teacher. So just so everybody understands the difference, it's teacher-led is traditional, and then you move over to unschooling or self-directed education, and that's child-led. Um, there's a lot of other differences, but that's really the main definition. Um, I believe it is the, the, the main difference. Yeah, awesome. Um, yeah, it was so interesting too. So this came up in conversation the other day between Andrea and I, is that unschooling doesn't necessarily mean that you're never gonna use curriculum or that you're never gonna have an adult teacher or that your kid even is never gonna go to regular school because it really is child-led a child is interested in taking a course or this happens a lot to parents like they they go on an unschooling journey and then their child decides that they want to go to regular school they want to see what's that what that's like and gain experience and that would fall into you know the unschooling framework is to allow the child to really um you know, guide their own life. It's not necessarily that, you know, you have to stay in a certain box of um, homeschooling or Sudbury schooling. So I think that's some clarification. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, personally, I don't, I don't consider myself a radical unschooler. Um, that's a really popular term in the unschooling world. And for me, it's a little too radical, I guess. We, we my daughter and I have a core set of agreements, or you might call them boundaries, or, um, and when we, her and I talked when, when she was six about, you know, moving from Montessori child-led school into unschooling, and her and I agreed on some boundaries or some lifestyle, and knock on wood, we've, we've stuck to them for, for a couple of years. No, actually, she was five when we, so, so we've stuck to those, and I don't think that those would would necessarily fall into the radical unschooling. Um, so it, it, I don't know if that 
term is interchangeable, but um, I do believe that in, in a pure unschooling self-directed education, um, the parents really do everything they can to allow their child to decide what type of education. Um, and I know it's not always possible. Um, and I think it's, a, you know, the family has to see what fits for the family as well. So again, if you're truly an unschooler or using self-directed education and your child says, hey, look, I wanna go to public school, Tip, you know, if your family can make that work, that would also that would be still considered unschooling or self-directed education. Um, so I don't see that a lot in the radical unschooling community. Um, I see more in that type of philosophy that you really do anything you can to not have any rules or any structure. Um, yeah. So um, just yeah. you know, just some little definitions. Well, I, I think that um, unschooling is such like a, there's so many gray areas that there's, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of freedom. So mm -hmm. when I, when I talk to parents, a lot of times, the, the one of some of the best things for parents is to take it step at a time and to do what feels right to you. So even my unschooling path with my kids, we did use some curriculum from time to time. And I have to admit that a lot of times when that came up, it was stemming from some of my fear, like, okay, well, I just want to make sure that you at least know this stuff. And it was like, I needed to go through the motions of that to see, to see uh, what worked for us and what didn't work for us. It almost every time when I decided that we were going to uh, do some uh, curriculum based, sort of like definitely adult led, like I was the one being like, all right, guys, we're going to do this. It ended up showing me what I needed to be shown, which was that um, on a certain level, this was not serving my children um, in the way that I thought that it was going to serve them. And my fears were, were sort of subsided. Like I was like, okay, I see now. My, my daughter's actually learning to read so much faster and on a, such an intuitive level and on a joyful level, just doing her own thing rather than uh, doing this program right here. And in fact, when I had gone through um, the motions, like when I had done like the workbook, I think we were using an app that time. Um, she told me, now I hate writing. Uh, now, I, you know, I'm starting to not write it. And I was like, wow, that's exactly what I don't want to hear come out of, coming out of your mouth. I think we're going to put this down. When before she was just naturally like writing these little notes all over the house and posting them up and asking me, you know, what letter is this? Um, so anyways, I share that story because it's okay in my book, it's okay to um, be who you are and be, be accepting of where you are. In fact, where you are is perfect and it's going to show you everything that you need. Just go through the motions, but, but it's part of also being, um, very like attuned to and open-minded to what's coming up as you do go through those motions, because sometimes what it's showing you is that what you're doing doesn't actually work for you. <laughs> uh, so we can learn from our experience. The word eclectic is coming to mind. And I think that, um, you know, one of the big piece of self-directed education or unschooling is freedom, like you said, and you can be eclectic. And I think that this is where my mindfulness training comes into play as well, is to just be in the moment. And um, like you said, a lot of the unschooling and de-schooling is really about us as parents. And even, you know, I just, I kept thinking that eventually I would, my healing journey would be over, you know, and then I would be like healed and, but it keeps going. And I've just accepted that um, as part of the process. So, um, you know, you're right, as things do come up um, and if there is some type of curriculum or schedule, I just say, um, for me, it's just about being honest with my child. And I say, like, look, I think we need to get out more. I know you don't want to do this because for us, I'm very social and I love going on play dates. And I tell my daughter because we don't have a school. So it's just and I'm also a single parent. So it's just her and I all the time, literally all the time, 24 seven. And when a play date does come up, I usually ask her do you want to go to the park today? And now it's winter here and it's freezing, literally freezing, below freezing. And um, sometimes she'll say, no, I'm not in the mood. I just want to, you know, do my electronics or play on my food, my, my phone. And sometimes I just say, hey, look, you know, I'm a person too. And I like the play dates because then I can talk to the moms. So, 
you know, we're child led, but I have an opinion. I have a voice too. It's my life too. So sometimes I, I do say, you know what, we're going and let's just make the best of this. Um, so that's kind of when our eclecticness comes in to play. You know, I'm not a hundred percent child led. I'm more kind of like a, you know, cooperative. Her and I are kind of like a team. Um, so that's kind of our, our specific approach. Yeah, I think you bring up a really good point. Like, what does child-led really mean? Like, does child-led mean that you just let the child walk all over you or like do whatever, do whatever they want in quotation marks, right? It's it's not that, I don't think that's the meaning of child-led, you know? I think that um, we show up as we are and we hold our personal boundaries. I think the meaning of child-led at its, at its core is to um, not push children in directions that we think they should go in for our own insecurities, our own biases. It's like honoring them as a human being, um, but also honoring ourselves because they learn so much when they, when they see an adult honoring who they are and honoring their needs. That teaches a child. Um, so yeah, I think that's a good clarification of child life. Yeah, we talked about that last time, and this is where your parenting expertise comes in. Um, you know, just being the ad, an admin for the self-directed group for a couple of years now, and I'm in some unschooling group. And I think what I notice on a lot of posts is it seems like a lot of parents think that it's submissive parenting, where, where the parent is really just a doormat for the child. Okay, you, you know, whether the parent is in the mood or not, you know, we're going, you know, let's go skiing, mom. And if mom doesn't want to go skiing, she just sucks it up and goes because the child is in control. And that's not at all, you know, what it is. I think there's like a sweet spot where um, your equal souls deciding together. Um, and there's some compromise and um, agreements are made rather than, um, you know, more in more of a traditional, the, the child doesn't have a choice, right? The traditional model, the child has to go to school, the child has to sit down, the child has to learn what is a, what is in that curriculum. Um, you know, most of their day is super ultra structured. Um, but, you know, then you come over to you know, Freedomville, and it's, you know, you have a whole full day of, um, or if you're in a Sudbury school, at least you have some type of structure, but in an unschooling format, a homeschooling unschooling format, um, there's a lot of free time, and um, there's a lot of decisions on, you know, what, what, um, what needs to be done for the home, or, you know, what, what, what does our family need? And um, so I think it's it's nice to, to put it out there that I feel when you execute self-directed education properly, then both, both the children and the parents feel empowered. And it, they both feel like you've got more say in what happens in your day um, and how the day flows. And that can be um, like co-creation at its finest. You know, you've got two people, us or two people, but maybe you've got a couple children, one parent, two parents, and everyone can follow their passion. And then you start getting into, well, what actually happens when you follow your passion? You get into synchronicity and, um, you know, amazing things start happening. And, you, you know, you could even call it magical. And then you're in the sweet spot, um, which is awesome. But being passion led doesn't mean every day, 100% of the time I'm in the zone. You know, there's, there's ups and downs and ebbs and flows, but it's really every day has some of those, um, you know, just like in the zone, um, really happy, high vibe moments. We've been, just for an example, my daughter has been, um, she got a really cool science kit and her and I have been playing with it. And it's just been fun, just pure fun. She wants to do it. And I'm kind of like her assistant and I'm happy to help her with measuring and seeing what happens. And it's just been super fun and all child led and I'm learning too. So it's been really um, just, just fun for both of us. And, and those moments we've been in the zone or in the passion mode. And um, I, I love it. You know, it's that even if it only lasts for a half hour or an hour or, you know, however long that those good vibes can get us through the whole day. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that mainly what we're learning um, on a core level that our children are learning when they're allowed to do what makes them feel good is that they can live a life that is that is based in joy and based in inspiration and then have it work. Um, I think that there's core conditioning that we all go through um, on this planet, basically, that you have to suffer to succeed. You have to, there's like no pain, no gain. You know, that's a common thing. And look, I'm not saying that you're never gonna experience pain if you're an unschooler or something like that. <laughs> it's just that we're not inflicting pain on people. We're not purposely inflicting harsh lessons onto, onto people, especially children, thinking that that's, that's what they need to develop into who they are. It's like life naturally brings us the learning that we need. And typically learning happens when we are, uh, we meet something that brings us some sort of pain, you know, whether it be psychological pain or, or whatever it is, when you're very young, it's pretty obvious, like learning to walk and you trip and fall type of thing. But we're learning we're, when psychological pain happens, basically like you have a challenge, you want to do something. Typically, this is how the unschooling path goes. You're following your bliss. So you want to go do something um, that you're inspired to do. But in order to do that, it brings you some challenges. Like you have to learn how to um, learn a skill. That's, that's a classic one. But I think with young children, even more than learning skills, uh, I guess it still falls in the category of learning skills, but it's coming into social dilemmas. So it's, it's getting into a fight with a sibling or a classmate or whatever it is. And then we're learning these social skills. But all of that, that's like natural life uh, quote unquote pain that's not being in, being inflicted by an adult. That's the learning. That's the natural curriculum that life is giving the child that's perfectly tailored for them. Um, and that's, those are the magic moments of unschooling. And that's how, that's how parents and facilitators um, can be very attuned to the natural curriculum that life provides. When we're tuned on that frequency and that level, um, it's so obvious that that life is offering us a learning experience that it qualms a lot of our fears that we may have about wanting to impose curriculum because we're seeing all the time that learning is happening on such an intuitive level, such a, um, just a perfect level, you know what I mean? Like curtailed just for you. You know, the same applies to us parents too. Um, the same applies to us when we're with our child and we're experiencing them um, or anywhere in life, but since the subject is children right now, when we're experiencing them being who they are and going through what they're attracted to and their life lessons, it naturally brings up our own limiting beliefs too and our own conditioning. So then when we meet psychological pain or whatever you wanna call it within our relationship with them, the, my practice is always to pause and look internal and find out where our limiting belief is. Because, because um, typically, well, I would say always, if we are feeling negatively, we've simply lost our way in thought. It's not necessarily that the situation or we need to go control our child or change what's happening or anything like that. The first step is always to find where we've lost our, our, um, our way in thinking, where we've believed some sort of negative story and it has us feeling negative, basically. And that's where we see ourselves, that's where we're enlightened ourselves into how natural learning is um, through regular life. And I think as parents go through that transformation, it's just so much easier to see how it works for children. Yeah, and that's, you know, I think that the magic is always in the present moment. So when we do, um, you know, lose our footing or wobble or, help, you know, start to feel uncomfortable or, uh, you know, unhappy, um, you know, th that's good that something comes up because that's a healing opportunity. Of course, in the moment, it could get, it could get ugly. You know, it's not always, it's not pretty when, when you, you know, when your mood changes and you're not, you know, happy in the moment, mom. Um, but like you said, you know, you can start to develop a practice of number one is always forgiveness you know, forgive myself for losing my footing. Um, and just a, a mo if you can pause, you know what, this doesn't seem to be working. Why don't we just take a break and allow myself, allow myself to do some inner reflection. Um, and, and then there is a lesson there, but if the lesson doesn't come right away, I mean, I don't think you have to dig around for it, but you can do some, some, 
some reflection to get yourself back into um, the present moment. So you're not lost in, oh no, something of the past or some worry about the future, you know, because that's what usually happens is like, oh no, if I'm not doing this, that then it, you, you know, I think the mind will tell a story, you know, and then there's some fear of something's going to go wrong in the future because I'm not doing something right now. So I think when we do lose our footing, and even when our child does as well, I think that's one of the joys and the gifts of unschooling is you're not on someone else's time clock, you're on your own time clock. So, you know, there's a balance, of course, if, if I notice my daughter is is losing attention or not into it, of course, I can try to support her and see if we can get through that kind of challenge or talk about it, but we can always just take a break. You know, we can go outside, we can get fresh air, we can just go in separate rooms. She can go, you know, um, because the, what I believe is that when you're, when you're off balance, when you're not present, right, when you're being triggered, you're not learning anything. Nothing is sinking in because you're in kind of like a tizzy, which is a natural state, but there's no need to keep pounding curriculum at that point because nothing is going to, it's not, you're not open, you're not receptive. So I think when, um, when we do get off balance or feel triggered, you know, however you want to call it. And it's natural. I mean, it happens every day, right? Um, there's points in every day when we're not feeling ourselves, we're not feeling um, you know, sturdy or balanced that, that, um, and then, and then I think over time, you just kind of get used to like, oh, wait a minute, I'm feeling off. Let me not take it out on the child. Let me, <laughs> you know, go into like auto correct mode and, um, come back to the child or, or, you know, when, when I'm feeling, um, more myself or when I can be in the present moment. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I think it comes down to classic projection. That's like a, a good um, example there. It's like projection is just believing that the world is outside of you and that other things are causing your discomfort besides yourself. Like something besides yourself is causing your discomfort. Where when we bring it all home, it's like, oh no, it's always my own mind that's causing my own discomfort on a, on some level. And the most tangible level that we can that we can get to is thought and the active thoughts that are that are coming through our consciousness. So whenever I feel that that upset feeling in any regard, like the negative scale feeling of any regard, doesn't matter. They all go into the same category. Um that's how I know that um yeah, I've, I've basically lost my way in thinking. So pausing is, is like the best thing ever. Children are classic examples. Children are classic examples of projection. They bring out all of our projection. And so your child is literally your teacher because they will bring that all up for you so that you can heal it. And at the end of the day, it's something to be grateful for. When we can, when we can get to that grateful place, is, that's when we know that we're doing work. That's when we know that we're doing the healing. But I think that the answer is really in the feeling. So um, it's, I, I think um, I had a quote before, it was like effortless healing is your birthright. And it's because it really is very simple. When you feel that feeling, it has something to tell you. Typically, I think we're so afraid of feeling that we try to push the feeling away or, um, you know, spiritual practice can even be turned into an escapism where it's like, oh, I'm just gonna, you know, find my mindfulness now and, and avoid that feeling that I was feeling. And that's actually not, the practice is to be mindful with the emotion, not, now there is a classic distinction here because, um, being mindful with an emotion is not believing the thoughts that are causing the emotion <laughs> or following the stream of thinking and makes the emotion bigger and bigger and bigger. The emotion is just a feedback loop. It's just telling you the energy of your, of your thinking, of your state of being, that type of thing. Um, so the practice is to just be with the emotion as if it were like you were like greeting um, a guest in your home. I think that's a classic mindfulness practice and just listening to what it has to tell you. And typically what it has to tell you is the story that the mind is telling at that moment is not the truth. 
of who you are. It's not the truth of how reality works, if you want to put it that way. And we have this sort of magnificent guidance system within us that will tell us when we're getting off track. It's almost like the whole illusion, the whole reality has been set up to guide us back home. And our children becomes our teacher because the, or our becomes our teacher because it's part of the whole uh, illusion, the whole game that's been set up for our own awakening. So um, that is specifically the type of uh, information, uh, guidance, whatever, that just lights me on fire that I'm really interested in. And I think unschooling pairs with that so perfectly because it it is focusing on um, the intuitive, intuitiveness of every moment. It's really staying attuned to the moment rather than thinking that we need to figure out what we need to teach ourselves or teach our kids. It's like the mechanism's already happening. Look at life. You just need to pay attention and know how to like read the cues. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's, but I'm, I'm right on the same page. But I also just wanna say that, I mean, it's taken me, I mean, I started deep, deep, deep healing um, even before my awakening and it, I needed in those, my first, probably, I don't know, 10 years, I needed a lot of help. I couldn't, um, self-analyze that well, because I had, I never, like I was, I was raised that emotions were bad and you just push them away or shut them off, or you just need to stop being upset um, and just move on. There's work to do. This is more, you know, all of these things are more important than how you're feeling. You have to push through the emotions, push them away. Um, so when I started self-healing, I was so emotional because I was expressing, you know, 30 years of emotions. So I just want to say personally, I needed a lot of help. So I did have therapists and life coach and so many people helped me. Um, and, and it was awesome. So I would say it took me a long time to be able to self-reflect and self-heal and even identify the negative beliefs. For a while, I needed help with that because um, I couldn't get out of my own way. Because when I did, when I did have strong emotions, I would I I couldn't just observe them. I was really in in them. Um, and sometimes I I mean I can remember being emotional or sad and just being in like waves of emotions that could take days. Um, so having a coach, you know, weekly or a therapist weekly for, for certain periods of times was so helpful for me. Um, and now I can, I can still rely back on coaches. Um, but now I'm at a point where I can self-reflect, um, and I can kind of just become the observer. I can observe what's happening, but that skill took me like literally 10 years to develop, um, it was not something that came easy to me personally. So I just want to say to any parents that might be listening that if you're noticing yourself get triggered or you're, you know, um, uh, triggered is just one way to say it, you know, just noticing yourself um, becoming off balance, out of alignment, um, and, and you're struggling with coming back, that's okay. And it's natural and it's normal. And mastering that process of keep coming back, you know, keep coming back to the print, however you want to say it, we're all, you know, it's all the same thing. Keep coming back to being in alignment, keep coming back to the present moment, keep, you know, um, mastering that is, is awesome. And I don't, I think that it, it takes a while and I don't know that we ever truly, truly will master it. Um, so I think that it's a great skill to, to work on and to get help with if, if you feel that that's, um, that, that, that is something you need help with. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Madeline, I know, I don't know if you're, if you're by your phone, but I, um, I'm I know here. Hey, I, <laughs> hi. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Um, hi. I can turn hi. my camera. I was just um, I don't know, not turning it on. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay. It's up to you. Whatever you're hi. feeling. Hi. It's good to see your face. Um, 
I did you have any questions? Because I know yesterday we were talking and I was wondering. So just um just so everyone knows, Madeline has an unschooling son as well, and she, and you've been unschooling for a while. So the questions that come from you are probably more like fine tuning and and along along the path of unschooling. You know what I mean, and I think that might be really relatable if you have anything that's coming to mind. Yeah, always so much. Oh, there he is. I should put my earphones on. <laughs> Hold on. I'm Love you. I'll walk in the other room. Um, yeah, you know, I think it's just always things are coming up. And I think it is a lot of uh, internal journey for me as the parent. Um, and I don't, I don't know if, I mean, I don't think you can get it wrong, I guess, in the big picture. I think whatever you're doing is probably what you should be doing. But, you know, and if it's not, it'll change. <laughs> but I think um, it's, it's tricky because it's really going against like what the bigger, what most people are doing. And so, you know, you're, you're not, at least for me, like I'm not, I don't see a ton of it. I mean, I have obviously goes to a, a a school. Um, but what I'm trying to say is like, when you're just surrounded, I feel like by more of the mo traditional schooling, et cetera, that I think for me, I guess, just, just always second guessing. And then you really have to remember like that it's a process and you just have to sort of trust that process. And there'll always be like these like glimpses of oh my gosh, this is like exactly what I should be doing. And it's like, per everything's perfect. And then there'll be bad days too, but they're not always really terrible. It's just, <laughs> yeah, I think it's like, again, it's just trusting the process. I think you really have to be a parent that, that can uh, shift your perspective and trust the process. Now, you probably don't end up um, here if you weren't willing to shift your perspective. Right. Totally. But I don't know. Um, you know, like what, what would you think like a bad day looked like, for example, because I, I, I <laughs> ask for a reason, like I like to dive into like what makes them bad, because in my experience, a lot of times, like the quote unquote bad days that I have with my kids are basically they're just doing stuff that is not hitting into my box of what I think they should be doing <laughs> and so <laughs> it's like oh today he spent all day on the computer or something and I'm like wait a minute you know I I those are the times when I kind of need to get um where, where I can find curiosity or whatever in what they're doing and being like okay you did spend all day on the computer but you did some awesome stuff on the computer I I don't know you mean for example but I know it's it's uh unique for you so I'm curious if there's anything specific coming up yeah, you know, what comes up a lot, and, and I think that's great, because actually, uh, he was talking today about making a Minecraft sword. It was so cute. And I was like, oh, yeah, we didn't actually go today. We're still working on our schedule for whatever. Anyway, um, but I don't know. I, I definitely, I think a bad day. I mean, he, I mean, sometimes he gets upset and stuff at school, but I think just in general, um, I'm always wor wondering or worrying. Okay. I guess maybe, I don't know if it's just that the, my son has autism. He's a tricky kid. He's, I wouldn't say if you're familiar with autism, he's not a severe kid, so he can speak and he has, um, and he's not a mild kid. He's sort of like right in the middle, like, and so it's always a spectrum, right? It's autism spectrum. And so he is a moderately autistic. And I feel like that creates interesting challenges that I wouldn't necessarily see with a mild child, which I'm sure they have their own challenges. And of course, severe kids have their own challenges. It's just a really interesting place to be. And so there's a lot of prerequisite skills that you might, that I, that I think of a lot that come up with the school and with the schooling process where I'm like, well, if he knew how to do this thing, then he'd be able to maybe do these other things at school that I think that he should be doing at school. Like even at a Sudbury school, like why isn't he like playing those video games or drawing some art or like creating something or painting or yeah. why is he using scissors? I mean, why, well, 
I don't know, like all these things that are kind of difficult, like motoring skills can be difficult for kids on the spectrum. Um, and so, you know, if he was in traditional school, they would sit him down and they would teach him these skills and then he would know how to do them. And we did a lot of ABA and all that kind of stuff at the very beginning for years. I um, mean, we've since stopped, but um, that's an example of like what I think he should be doing at school. <laughs> <laughs> even at a story school what he is doing is what I see is sort of playing like he's just always playing and running around he's always exploring and like I really don't he's in his mind a lot like playing out these scenarios and that's fun yeah. for him. <laughs> I think it, so it's just me just for a background, if, if anyone ends up watching this and and wants to know so Madeline's son goes to a Sudbury school the same Sudbury school that my kids go to um so that's the school that we're talking about um and and this is what I mean by your experience uh brings like sort of a when the rubber meets the road type questions it's like okay so I'm already along this path I'm doing this but like what about the stuff like this when kids have so much freedom and you know yeah I think it's very helpful what comes to mind what comes to mind um, when you're talking is, okay, so I think when we go along our unschooling path, the mind will start to come in. Like naturally, if we're here, we know that it resonates with us, right? We know that we chose this for a reason and it's speaking to our heart for some reason. But naturally our conditioning comes in that says, well, maybe I should be doing something different or maybe there's something missing. If that thought, if that thought process comes into your mind and it doesn't feel good, that means it's coming from fear and it's coming from some negative sort of beliefs. As we work through those, as we self-examine through self-inquiry and stuff like that, as we re come to our center or our alignment, which is if anyone's curious, I can totally take you through a process of how to do that. But, um, but what I'm saying is when we, when we are in our center, naturally what speaks to us is inspiration. So when inspiration comes, that is when it's totally cool to share with your kid how to use scissors. Like it's totally okay to be like, hey, um, you know, can I help you here? Can I help you there? The tricky thing is with unschooling is like where it's not about pushing. It's about like gifts and we give a gift we don't follow up with the person you know after Christmas and are like so are you using that gift I gave you <laughs> like <laughs> that's not how it's how it's done it's like we're just we're in our child's life for a reason though and we can listen to what lights us up the the difference between what lights us up and what pressures us and makes us feel negative is everything though and that's when we know what state of being and what thought forms we're coming from yeah, that's actually really helpful, I think, because I could probably sit on that, oh, oops, every day. Because generally speaking, because of the, um, some of this uh, condition of autism brings up on a daily basis some challenges um, that a neurotypical kid probably doesn't experience, although of course everybody experiences challenges. It's just a little, it looks different that I could better hone in on like my feeling about what I want to like be, in, is it inspired feeling or not? You know, like, can I, I, I would, I mean, I guess you'll know, I'm sure you would know right away, but it's a good thing to think about because there are a lot of, um, you know, decisions that could still be made or like things that could be done or not done. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think it's interesting to hear from um, like most, I, I, I always say this and I or think this at least, like if, an, if I had a neurotypical kid, like nothing would bother me. Like I'd be like, oh, they're totally fine. Like everything's great. Like everything would be totally fine. Like they can talk perfectly. They can communicate their needs and they know how to like do it. And then I'm like, that's like absolutely not true. Like there would, <laughs> there would definitely be stuff that would come up. Um, yeah. And I think, I think that like that thought itself that comes up like, oh, if I, and then that relates to everybody. If something were different, I would feel differently. And then I think that that's a core, the reason why that doesn't feel good, like, oh, if something were different, everything would, I'd, I'd be feeling better. It's a core belief of just distrusting the way that everything's playing out. 
as it is. Um, and it has like our state of being so, um, so uh, vulnerable to circumstances and not realizing that the circumstances that are happening are, are totally perfect for us and that we're, we're always supported. You know, something came across my path the other day um, where, okay, how can I share this without giving personal information away? So, um, okay, I just was shown an example where someone who I thought like maybe didn't have the best business background was going into business venture. And it brought up a lot of fear in me. Like I was like, well, are you going to be able to pull that off in my own mind? I didn't share this with them, but I'm like, wow, is life, you know what I mean? Like, are you equipped to do that? And then as they went through their path of following their own inspiration, they ended up coming across a business partner who had a lot of business savvy information. And it's almost like that person didn't need to be business savvy. They just need to follow what is, is inspiring to them. And life sort of shows up for you when you do that and brings you what you need. I think that I share that story because it's so relevant, I think, especially for neurodiverse uh, people for anyone, but especially neurodiversity. Do we believe that our child, no matter what shape, form, tendencies they come in with, whatever whatever code they come in with, do we believe that somehow the laws of the universe don't apply to them, that they're not also supported and, and everything that they need is, is provided? I think a lot of times neurodiverse kids come to sort of reflect that to us and sort of uh, bring up those belief systems in us so that we can we can heal them and watch how also naturally these children are perfect for the life that they're in. That doesn't mean that we never support them. Our job is is also to support children, but that support can come from feeling good. It doesn't need to come from all of the all of the stress stuff that puts pressure on us. That's our own healing. Yeah. No, that yeah. I mean, I've seen a lot of kids in in traditional schools um and it's not like, you know, black and white, like, oh, one is bad or the other. It's just that they, they, they aren't necessarily happy. You know, even, and, and especially like, you know, I, I, from what I've seen, like in my experience, especially with neurodiverse kids in traditional schools that you, there's a lot more um, effort involved in trying to conform them to that. Like, you're not going to be going with ease. Yeah, I mean, I can speak to that. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I mean, I know, especially up here in Massachusetts, for I know a lot of families that actually choose the public school system for, you know, um, neurodiverse children because they get so much support. Like you said, you know what? You're not, <clears throat> I have a little bit of a cold still. Um, you know, you know what, you're not doing the scissors, then you get a specialist and you will, we'll do scissors for hours. And then you, then we'll move on to the next thing and the next thing. So I would imagine going from um, having so much support and so much, not that the child enjoys it, that's a whole nother, you know, but having, I think that in a traditional system, there's so much more, at least from what I see, there's so much more help, like you said, to get them kind of, you know, up to speed with the other kids where, and then you go into an unschooling and I would imagine that it's just, okay, now you're, you know, to, there must be some feeling of like, you know, going from being so support, feeling that they need so much extra help. And then like, let's just let it all naturally unfold. I can imagine as a parent, there'd be like, it's so different to me, the way I see it is opposite ends. It's like super, super, super supported and helped to, you know, complete freedom where it's like, we'll just let you learn all that naturally. So I don't know if you resonate. Did, did you ever do traditional for your child? No. Okay. Yeah. So, so super unconventional of me because he had, it was like, definitely don't send him to a self-directed school. That was the advice I was given. So I went ahead and sent him to a self-directed school. No, we did, um, he was diagnosed at two years and seven. So he was almost three and we started a speech OT right at two, years, seven, five. So he was like two, seven, five. We started speech and OT. He did go to a preschool, um, like, but it was um, for special needs for like three months before he turned three. Cause it's like funded until they're three. 
that was absolutely mortifying. And, um, thank God it was only three months. And then, um, from three to six, he, or three to five and a half, he was in about 30 hours a week of in-home service therapies. So he did like speech, OT, ABA, where he learned, um, you know, like daily living skills and basic identification of like work and how to request, um, oops, sorry, how to request um, things and all that kind of thing. And then, yeah, and then I just didn't, and then I sent him straight away from there. You know, it's interesting the, with the, with unschooling and, and self-directed, it's also a lot of things that about like living, you know, like getting up in the morning. So it was like so early to get to school by eight, the bell ringing and all that was always really tricky. I mean, kids on the spectrum have like notoriously have to sleep issues too. Not that it was like, you know, we could have done it, but, and we did do therapy early in the morning and stuff but not that that it just suited it was almost like it felt more natural to like allow him some space he needed like more space in the morning he needs a little space and to like um I don't know how to explain it no and I feel like I feel like that it's almost like a lot of times neurodiversity points like you've used this phrase before Madeline when I spoke with you it's like the what is it canary in the coal mine type of a thing yeah exactly where 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 you the child is pointing out what is wrong for everybody in a way like hey conditioning people to be on a certain schedule um monday through friday from like 8 a.m to whatever is like totally not intuitional living and showing like a one frame of life that you it to me it it told me that i have to live this way in order to survive and it's like a survival fight or flight thing. It's like, I have to do this to survive. Now, as an adult, as we go through the unschooling process, I'm relearning that, wow, there's a totally intuitional way of life where you can listen to what you are feeling, what your, what your body tell is, which is really an extension of your mind is, is, is giving you feedback for. And when you listen to that, life falls more into alignment. So with neurodiverse kids, it's like they're demanding. It's almost like they're demanding, no, you have to listen you're going to start listening. We're entering a new paradigm here of listening. (laughs) So, yeah. Yeah. No, for sure. I mean, it definitely was um, almost like, and he would just be, I, we tried a lot of different things and he would just be like, I mean, he was out, he was sleeping at seven 30 in the morning. I mean, he wasn't going to get up and go to school. Yeah. And neither am I. <laughs> and I mean, like even my kids that I work with um, are like half asleep at that hour, but yeah. you know, I think. So by um, the way, on the background, Madeline is a school psychologist. She has a background in the stuff of dealing with um, all of the, uh, you know, potentially negative effects of traditional school system. And then she actually counsels students. So coming from her background, coming from someone who has worked in this industry and then makes the decision to send their kid to a Sudbury school is very, very telling. In fact, when we get on uh, group calls within our uh, community of parents that do go to the Sudbury school, it is remarkable the percentage of them that work inside the traditional school system and then decide to send their kids to a Sudbury school or unschool. And I think that's just so yeah, telling, basically. <laughs> I see that in the homeschool world up here as well. A lot of the homeschool moms I meet were in the system at one point, or um, most of them are out now and they're just like, you know what, I just, they've reached like some type of breaking point. Um, But I think that with, you know, the longer you're kind of in that traditional mindset, I mean, I would just say, just just be patient and forgiving as you kind of de-school yourself you know, and, and the child as well, you know, the, you know, patience and and forgiveness and all that, um, healing process, you know, um, Andrea, can I ask, did I say your name right? Yeah. Yeah. Andrea. Yeah. (laughs) I can read. Um, wait, so how old is your, um, do you have a daughter? Yeah. I have one daughter. She's eight. Oh, 
okay. So yeah, so my son's nine. Okay. And did she go to regular school at some she, point? She never went to traditional. Um, she did go to like a three hour preschool, um, but it was super, super um, comforting. They didn't really have much of a schedule. It was three hours. They were outside playing for an hour. Um, so she did some preschool and then we went to Montessori um, because I loved the child led model. Um, so I'm on, you know, I'm really removed from the traditional, like I can remember some of what happened with me 30 years ago. And I can right. hear like when I, when I talk to other parents, um, but I've been D I was like de-schooling myself before I even knew what it knew it was a thing, you know? Yeah. That's interesting. So you came to it on your own from your own, um, journey but didn't have, like did you have a native experience in traditional schooling or were you just it was just from your own sort of awakening yeah I mean that for, makes sense yeah for me sorry my phone had died so I keep moving to charge yeah, yeah. No, you're breaking up for me it, my spiritual awakening became came even before I had my daughter so, um, and I had real, I had come to the awakening that all of this conditioning was really the problem. I thought I was the problem, <laughs> but it was really the conditioning, um, the conditioning of never feeling good enough, always being judged and graded and tested and just always wanting to work hard, never being good enough. So when I became pregnant, that's when I started to look at alternative education and homeschooling, child-led. And luckily I found um, Abraham Hicks, which talked about Sudbury. So I, I was really excited and I started to do a lot of research, um, when I was pregnant. Um, so I yeah. had had it in my mind. Yeah. So yeah. I remember now that you mentioned that at the beginning, I think I've heard some of those, um, videos that she speaks on. Um, I've, I've literally like, listen, I, I, cause I, there aren't that many of them. I feel like maybe, but I, I listened to her a lot and I, I remember looking up her meets, um, you know, even just kids on the spectrum and also definitely she talked about Sudbury schools for sure. So that's cool. Um, okay. Yeah. I like that. I like that. I think the beginning of my finding my path to this kind of self-directed education, definitely she was along the way for me too somewhere awesome. That's yeah 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 and sometimes when I find if I can when I find myself you know off balance or out of alignment if I can listen to even if it's not on parenting but I love all the Abraham Hicks stuff on parenting and schooling and even the neurodiverse stuff is just amazing um you know that that she's just like oh they're actually like gifted you know and they're processing so much faster and that's actually like what the world needs you know right. but then from a parent's perspective you're like you know it's it's just amazing I love I totally recommend Abraham if it resonates you know yeah. to help. Uh, <laughs> no I, I I I love her too um no yeah I see that I see that um a lot with um kids especially my son they'll be like glimpses of like Oh, I had you all fooled the whole time. <laughs> I'm sure going on the whole time. I was like, oh, yeah. oh, it's so funny. Yeah, <laughs> we couldn't figure out how to go live. We're supposed to be live on Facebook right now, but it wouldn't. It wouldn't work. We have like some setting that we have to adjust. Oh, I don't know yeah. Facebook, so I can't help. But um, yeah, I, no worries. I was just like more stating what was in my head. Mean, oh, because you're on a Zoom. Yeah, I yeah, don't get it. Zoom. Next time, we'll we'll figure it out. Um, is it? Um, will you be on a Zoom next time, or will I need to join through Facebook? Well, hopefully, we can still do it through Zoom and th and through this link to not confuse people. But I'll let you know if we change it. Yeah, and that's. Um, I don't have. It I have like a setting on Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. Are you um? Yeah, I, I do think about unschooling. Well, it's like a form of self-directed education. It's just at home, right? Yeah, like that's, like that's why, because like with you, I, I know you very well. So so I know, it, yeah. Is it specifically with the school that you have questions or is it unschooling in general? Like, 
you know what I mean? Is it wondering whether the school is, is the right choice or? Yeah, yeah, no, I think for me, yeah, it's definitely not. I, I just think that I, I think you, in order to do even just like, for me, unschooling, I would have to be even more trusting. I would be like, I would be like, it would be more difficult for me, I think. I think it's cool. I mean, don't get me wrong. Like, I think it's awesome, but I would be like, oh, wow. because there's some pieces of it that I, it's, it's tricky. Like, cause especially cause I'm trying to get him to like, oh, like interact or communicate on like a social level. Cause that's kind of, cause he does like to be alone. I just think it's interesting, but I know that when there's an unschooling community, there's like the outings that you mentioned earlier. And those are nice to have like a, opportunity right but only if you're interested in going or like you said if it feels like maybe that's something that you should be doing together for that day or something like that yeah I mean for me to choose unschooling um, and to feel confident as a parent that's executing the unschooling that's you know we did two years of Montessori which up here there there's not I mean it's you're either in a private school that's like 20,000 and up or um or, or you're, you're, you're doing it on your own in a, in a homeschool format. Um, in my particular, there are some learning centers in Massachusetts, but none in my general area. Um, so being in the Montessori private school, seeing them execute the child led, it was, is what really helped me. But you know, I know that we're, we're coming on a little bit after seven, so maybe we can continue this conversation next week. I, I think, I think we're still going to keep the zoom. I think Angela and I just have to figure out how to be on yeah. zoom and yeah, then also get it on live. Um, so yeah, <laughs> yeah, I hope, um, I hope we can, can, can continue this conversation. Who knows what'll come up next week, but yeah. having it, having a space to chat, especially with different, you know, I'm like, that's awesome. You know, it's, it, I think it's just great to hear different people's perspective because we're all doing our best to allow our children to be free. And that comes with a whole lot of um, challenges and also, you know, opportunities as well. So I think it's great that we can um, have this space to talk and, um, um, you know, share what's happening and, and help each other. Totally. Yay. And thanks for hopping on on this uh, somewhat practice run, just getting used to how it's going to flow. And I hope some of the conversation served you and I'm excited to, to hop on next week as well. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, both of you. I appreciate you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you thank for you. being honest. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, Bye. sayonara. We'll, we'll see you next week. <laughs> see you next week. All right. Thank you.